Cool. Hi, I'm Sam. Welcome to the seventh of the Labor History in Australia, the history of Australian Labor. Um, uh, this week we're going to be talking about weevils in the flower, the Communist Party of Australia and Labor, us, in the 1930s and a bit of the 1920s. So we're going to go through the 1920s fairly fast. Um, this is historical. The method of history works on the basis of us being wrong. Um, normally I try and explain that I'm not an expert in this area, but my expertise is growing because we're getting closer and closer to the area where I do have real expertise. So I'm a bit more liable. The other thing we're using is we're using this theory of class struggle called composition, decomposition, recomposition. So composition is how we set ourselves up as a working class to fight. Decomposition is when the bosses fight against us and reduce our power by changing the basis of how power works. And recomposition is when we figure it out again and go back to fight. Last week, we saw the period of the 1900s and 1910s and early bit of the 1920s, where we managed to fight to a revolutionary situation in Australia under war, where we grew new unions of unskilled people and where we managed to get better wage deals than we would have gotten, than the boss would have liked us to get. This week, we're going to be talking about the long recession. Now, most people from high school learn that the depression began in 1929 with the failure of the US stock market. This isn't true for the Australian working class. The Australian depression began in late 1918, early 1919, when the demand for wool and wheat in war reduced dramatically. Now, Australian capitalism recovered by the mid-1920s. The Australian working class recovered in 1942 with the war. So we're talking about the kind of long depression we saw in the 1880s earlier, or we've lived in our own lives since the mid to late 1970s, the depression for working people. So the, the character we're focusing on is an organisation on the whole of workers, the Communist Party of Australia. And I think it's worth stating that the Communist Party of Australia has been much more working class than the Labor Party in Australia in its leadership, though rank-and-file branches have been dominated by the working class in the Labor Party, and much more working class than the small little socialist leagues or Victorian socialist parties we saw earlier. The Communist Party was also less male-dominated than the IWW, and deliberately so. Um, the Communist Party came out of cannot record video. Well, sorry, guys, um, we've had video problems, so you're going to be hearing me only on the internet. The Communist Party came out of the IWW's failure in the war period and the Trades Hall Reds and the small groups of socialists who were organised. By about 1923, it had lost many of its Trades Hall Reds and IWW figures and the Communist Party of Australia declined over the 1920s. It wasn't very well organised. It wasn't the kind of lockstep image we have of the Soviet Communist Party it was fairly open, but it was desperately interested in what was happening in Russia, as if you wouldn't be when you think a revolution's going on and all that you read says to your evidence that one's going on. But it was declining, it was disorganised, it wasn't very together. What happened in the late 1920s is the international communist movement organised out of Moscow looked around at the variety of parties and started telling them to clean their act up. Now, this is a good thing for Australia in a couple of ways. Kind of the bad thing is it put Sharkey in charge of the party. Now, Sharkey was a charismatic, highly organised figure. He had a background in the working class, but his formal trade was journalism, at least in the 1940s. Not that he worked on journalism except for the communist paper. But for all that we can say bad about Sharkey and his rigorous control of the party, that rigorous control was focused on achieving real outcomes for the working class movement. I mean, this is one thing we need to think of the Communist Party through into the 1960s. They wanted it to happen. They really did, and they were very organised about it. And the Sharkey party sees this change towards a highly organised party body, far, even, far more organised even than the Daniel de Leon-influenced early socialist sects, far more organised than the IWW, out there recruiting women, bringing them into the party. But we're going to leave Sharkey and talk about the 1920s briefly and what was happening to the working class. With the downturn in the war economy, it became harder and harder to get wage increases, not as hard as it would be in the 1930s. And while 
In the last couple of weeks, we've seen the formation of new massive plants of industry, like the harvester plant over 70-something acres, I think. The 1920s brought a split industry between huge industries like BHP Newcastle, which started with 1,500 workers and grew and grew and grew, and small plants organised by local groups of capitalists. So um, BHP Newcastle was a leader in Australian industrial organisation. It was organised by American capitalists, and what they did was they brought in a bunch of Yank engineers, set them up in nice bungalows on top of the plant, paid them separately to the rest of the workers, and then drew the Newcastle working class in through the plant and managed them far more closely than Australian workers had ever been managed before. And the deal that the ALP government who set them up was that they could run their own industrial relations system in Newcastle more or less. <coughs> they ran time and motion in ways which weren't covered by the awards. The awards were wage deals that covered everybody who was a steel worker or a bricklayer Australia-wide more or less. And this, this way of running the plant made it far more efficient for the boss, but also far more of a hell for workers. Like, they excluded workers on the basis of their militancy or their religion. And one thing that comes out of the 20s in Newcastle, this is a classic joke, you turn up for work and you turn up in a bullpen, which means a bunch of 200 men waiting for day work. And you turn up and if you don't have a lunch box, you're not going to get picked. And if you turn up and the hiring man looks at your lunchbox and weighs it and it weighs nothing, you're not going to get picked because you're not going to work out the shift properly. So what people did was put bricks in their lunchbox to be able to go to work. Wow. Yep. And it will get worse like that when we hit the 30s. Now, some of the sources I'm using for this, I'm using a bit of Tom O'Lincoln's Into the Mainstream, The Decline of Australian Communism, whose first chapter is a good summary of this early period of the Communist Party Australia. But I'm also using Wendy Lowenstein's wonderful, beautiful oral histories, which she got out of Australian workers and Australian middle-class people just by sitting down and talking to them. And they're a beautiful read. The two ones which I'd recommend for this week is Under the Hook, which is a story of the um, stevedores, the dock workers, and also Weevils in the Flower, which is the name of this week's talk, which is the story of the depression for Australian workers. Um, what happened across the 1920s is leading sites like um, the docks saw strong unions, unions that had been organised since the 1870s, fighting the conservative government under Stanley Bruce. Now, there was a period of striking in the mid-1920s which makes these different to the rest of the organisations in that they had the capacity to still keep fighting. Now, we aren't talking about a group like the CFMEU that has done very well for its trade sections, so much so that I'd recommend people get a trade rather than go to university these days. We're talking about the hungry mile of Australian dock working. We're talking about people on the margins of survival taking regular nationally organised strikes for wage advances and for conditions. What this did was because the docks were so important, so central for Australian capitalism, all of the capital coming into the country in the form of machines, all of the capital going out of the country in the form of wheat and wool and coal, black coal from Newcastle, went through the docks. The dock workers were a decisive element of the Australian working class and they knew it and they fought even though they were on the margins. And they were normally hired by a bullpen system. What the government did was it tried to introduce tickets like we talked about around Eureka. Now, as it's been mentioned to me, it is a matter of analysis whether you viewed the Eureka miners as workers or something else. But in the case of the dock workers, they were workers. And the Bruce government managed to, by breaking strikes, inflict a ticket of work system where you had to get a government ticket to work in the industry. What this resulted in was a good union that became the MUA, we know, and a bad union, a union of scabs. Now, these scabs were partially religiously organised, but they were mainly the workers who just couldn't take it anymore, who had gone under so hard and far and fast that solidarity became a thing they could no longer afford in their lives. And the example I'd put is, if you go in with an MUA ticket and stand in the MUA bullpen, it's only when the scabs bullpen is empty 
will MUA day workers get hired? And the government... This is like work choices in the 1920s, in the late 1920s, except we didn't have a bunch of officials who had proved to capitalism they could run it better than the Liberal Party in the modern Labor Party. We had a situation where the working class movement wasn't as heavily organised with an ACTU encompassing almost all unions. We had fractured national unions and we lost the dog collar fight and the government won. And this was the opening of the 1930s. And the 1930s hit Australia hard because one of the first things to go under in an international depression is the price of wool and wheat and coal, the price of the most basic start-up goods in a capitalist system. They're the ones who collapse first and hardest. And a lot of people lost their land, the small farmers, the small soldier settlers who'd been settled on dodgy land. But I'm less concerned about them and more with the effect on the unions. Most unions in the 1920s had been weak and government dependent. They'd been depending on the awards. They'd been depending on the cost of living adjustments through the A series of living and then the C series of living, which we talked about in the harvester weeks, which are basically a measure of inflation. So up until the 1930s, early 1930s, your wages would be adjusted as inflation changed. And capitalists were happy with this because inflation wasn't significant until the depression brings deflation, a lowering in the cost of goods and a far more rapid lowering in the cost of labour or wages. And they went to the courts and they got on the ability to pay argument. The employers said, we no longer have the ability to pay for this. And the courts reduced all of our wages. And despite this wage reduction, a lot of us got sacked. Now, one of the things the Labor government in New South Wales tried to do was what the recent Labor government tried to do in the international recession. They tried to have the government pay for people to build things. And this was Lang. And international capital got together. And when I say this, this isn't a conspiracy theory. There is an excellent PhD thesis from the University of Sydney out of... Um, work and organisational studies, which goes through the chats. So the British capitalists got together and said, oh no, we don't believe that Australians should try and spend their way out of the recession. Now actually what happened was every country that tried to spend its way out of the recession, eventually it worked for them. The US government under FDR, the Nazi government, the Soviet government. Now we might debate whether the Soviet government is capitalism or not, but they actually invested throughout the 1930s continuously where all of the capitalist governments, which we know and hate in the West, tried to reduce their spending. And it worked for the Yanks and it worked for the Nazis to a certain extent and it worked for the Soviet Union. And when Australian Labor in New South Wales tried this, he got dismissed, like Whitlam got dismissed. Sneaky deals with governors and all that jazz, but it split the Labor Party in New South Wales. And Lang Labor started off looking more left-wing, but rapidly became more right-wing. And working-class families still remember into the 1970s and 1980s, they went Lang. We're not going to talk with them. But even in the worst parts of the recession of the 1930s, there was a fight on. There was a fight from the remnants of the IWW through the Unemployed Workers' Union. There was a fight through the Labor Party, which still had active unionists at their base and labour-aligned unions. And there was a fight from the Communist Party of Australia. Now, a lot of this was fights like we saw before, free speech fights. Fights in public over this in the socially conscious areas. But two of the issues I'd like to talk about, which most people kind of know about, one's the rent strikes. This was communist organised. So they picked four suburbs. They picked Carrington in Newcastle. They picked a suburb in the central area in Wollongong, Illawarra and they picked one place in Newtown and one place in either Blacktown or Bankstown. It was Union Street and it was Bankstown. Bankstown, thank you. Union Street in Newtown, Bankstown out west. What they did was they found a house where the most respectable labour-type working-class family was about to get evicted, and they filled the house with about 200 trade unionists and communists with brick bats and sticks and fought off the police for hours and hours and hours. And the effect of this 
was that people got evicted. But the other effect was it forced the government to change the eviction laws slightly and it reduced evictions on the whole. And one of the things that um, Lowenstein in Weevils in the Flower talks about is the midnight flit. We all know the phrase, the midnight flit. What is the midnight flit? You get a dray truck or a couple of horses, load up the house, go to the new house you've rented under a new name and move your pitiful furniture to the new house the same day until the landlord comes 18 weeks later for the overdue rent and then you do another midnight flit around the suburbs. And the only way this works is if people will attest that now you're the Johnsons, not the Smiths. And the only way this will work is if somebody with a horse dray will lend you the horse dray or give it to you for mates rates or whatever. And this kind of resistance is essential for the people who manage to get a, keep a hold of houses. But the other side of this is the unemployed camps. Now, many men went roving on the backs of trains to try and find work wherever they could, but women and children couldn't move because women were still the people who kept the household running through strikes or through actions or whatever. And what you ended up with was in every major city a system of camps. Now, there was a difference between your family camps and your men's camps. So down at La Perouse, where there was an actual concentration camp for Aboriginal people, on the beaches around there, there also formed white shantytown camps. In Newcastle, there were three camps. There was the men's camps on um, Nobby's Beach. And I, don't, I wouldn't want to live on Nobby's Beach without shelter in winter. It is directly on the sea. There was the family camp at what was then the Free Speech Commons, um, opposite the main TAFE in Ties Hill. And there was also the fascist camp. The fascist camp was in what we know now as Civic Park, but which was also a garbage dump in that day and age. And one of the things which many of us don't remember is the organised fascism in Australia. Sir John Monash, a brilliant general, a conservative British thinker, and also a Jewish man, organised one of the first white armies in the world. He organised it using returned soldiers, and the purpose of it was to put down labour in dispute. They took over when there was a police strike in Melbourne. And this kind of system went underground. In New South Wales, they were the old and new guard. These are the same men on horseback who got trained in 1905 in boyhood conscription. In Victoria, it was organised through a white army, which was organised by the state. And this white army had an activation system. And it went wrong on two occasions, where in rural areas, they activated thinking the Labor Party was about to start a bloody revolution. Now, what's interesting about it is a lot of Labor figures, local Labor figures, were members of the white army. Because it kept from these people the purpose of the group so very strongly. I mean, thankfully, the labour movement was far too organised to allow fascism to happen in Australia. But the other side of it is that there wasn't a revolutionary situation in Australia like in 1916-17 until the 40s. So there was no need for them until the 40s. You know, and they opened Sydney Harbour Bridge early by a dickhead on a horse with a sabre running through it. He was a fascist underground member. Good story, that one. Mm. The other side of this is the rabbitos and the survival system. So rabbit these days is about $20 a rabbit from a butcher if you can get it all. Rabbit was depression food for a very long time. A couple would take a farm management position and be offered all the rabbit they could eat and no money. Free rent and all the rabbit you can shoot. In this kind of context, the ALP was at a loss in relation to the unions. Now, the ALP organised workers' defence groups like the Communist Party did, but they weren't as organised. And many of the ALP union figures were at a loss of what to do because the award system had broken down. They'd just got their first official pay cut through the award system. The Communist Party, which was newly organised, very heavily organised, started seeding in the early 1930s. It sent members into workplaces to recruit people. It sent most of its new working class members into workplaces. And we're not just talking about Big Steel or the docks. We're talking stuff like the fire brigades, the teachers' federation, 
the Journalists Association, the people who set up the Theatre and Performing Arts Union were communists. They were the ones who made it roll. And one of the things which I'd like us to talk about after this is off, and I'm not going to talk about here, because it is a long-standing tradition you don't talk about this in a recorded way, is the nuts and bolts of organising. But we're talking about a party that is newly reformed, that is much smaller than it would be until the 1970s, already making a commitment to industrial organisation by sending its members out to organise. The IWW relied on the existing working class organisation and recruited. The Communist Party built. And what they built was unions with cohered leaderships and factions in unions, which spent a lot of their lives talking and working together. They took what people knew from ordinary working class organisation and made it better and stronger and spent most of their time doing this in the 30s. The other thing the Communist Party did was it recruited people to a peace movement. Now, the Labor movement had come out in favour of a peace movement generally in the war in China. But the women's movement in the communist movement recruited some of the best activists for equal pay. Communist marriage was tended to be between two activists, one from the CPA movement and one from the rest of the Labor movement, because the CPA liked to avoid um, organisational incest. Now, it also liked you to encourage your partner to join the Communist Party. But there was kind of an idea that communists shouldn't marry communists, that the organisation shouldn't just be reduced to a group of true believers. And these women were not put to the side to organise the strike committees alone. The Communist Party women, even when they weren't working, were fighting for stuff like free speech through the Australian Civil Liberties Association, which the Communist Party would set up. They were the backbone of the peace movement having to deal with the religious pieces. They organised for peace in a way in which the trade union and labour movement hadn't organised for World War I. And they were strongly the core of the equal pay movement because in the 1920s and 1930s it looked hopeless. The other thing that came out of the peace movement was the blacking of steel to Japan. So even at its worst, the labour movement in Australia was able to take actions that they weren't able to take before the First World War. This is a labour movement where the docks have been split in two by right-wingers. This is the place where artists and unemployed men are desperate for work on the docks and the people whose natural living is the docks are being shunted out by newbies who will bust a gut. Know the phrase? This means to give yourself a hernia by working too far. That is what it is to bust a gut. You get a guy who's desperate for wages in on the docks, he will bust a gut for the employer. You get somebody who knows how to work in the docks for a living, they won't bust a gut. If you're going to keep it up for 20 or 30 years, you can't bust a gut. So even though they're fighting off scabs and desperate unemployed men to keep their jobs, Illawarra, black steel under Menzies the first time he was in government. And they won. And the entire trade union movement came out against them. And this wasn't a strike over wages and conditions. This was a political strike to defend Chinese workers from Japanese imperialist aggression. Now, it would have been nice if the Communist Party had managed to do that in 1939 or 1941, but they faced different struggles in 1939 and 1941. So even in that, we can win. And perhaps the win I want to end on is that we maintained the secret of organising when everything went to shit around us. This is a depression far worse than 1880 to 1914. New industries are not being built like they were in that early period. New industries stopped being built around 1929. This is a depression so bad that people are living in work camps. When unemployed workers movement Union, a union of unemployed workers are fighting cops to keep as many families as they can in shitty housing. And yet they maintain coherent unions and they maintained an exciting growing new party. Now some people like Nick Oroglass who was a Trotskyite from the early 1930s would disagree about the excitement 
of the Stalinized Communist Party under Sharkey. But yet the Communist Party was growing and doing great works for the working class and respected for it. People would buy the Communist Party of Australia newspaper, <coughs> some for the stories. Do you know why most would buy it? They'd buy it for the best fucking racing tips in Australia. The Communists had an in with the bookies and with the jockeys and with the horse trainers and the muckers and they had the best tips in Australia. They were interesting and exciting to working class people in a way in, even in which the IWW wasn't. The IWW never managed to sell weekly papers in the same suburb over and over again and be respected for their work by the vast majority of the working class. And we maintained this through the worst depression in our history. We maintained a labour movement that towards the end of the depression was growing even in non-communist organised unions where communists were inspiring labour lefts to fight better and even labour rights to fight better. An inspired fighting movement ready for an upturn in capitalism and the best moment to fight. And unfortunately, the best moment to fight turned out to be an imperialist war and first the Labour Party and then the Communist Party came out in favour of the war. And that's next week. But we managed to hold it together in a way in which we didn't from the 1970s. But there are some lessons for us, and I'd like to talk about the secrets of organising when the video or the audio is off, because that's secret working class business, and we shouldn't share it outside of conversation. Thank you. <laughs>